this morning, I've looked forward to this for like two years when I first started trying to cajole Jan Carlberg to come and, uh, and speak in chapel. Um, you're in for a treat. You're in for a treat. And I, I also want to welcome, there are, there are alums around the world watching uh, this morning service uh, because of their feelings and the investment that they feel that they received from Jan Carberg in her years here. Jan Carberg, um, her husband Judd was the president of Gordon College for nearly 20 years. When you walk in that middle door, if you look above, I told her this morning, there's not many times you speak in a room where your name's over the doorpost, but you'll see um, Judson and Janice Carberg. Uh, this sanctuary is dedicated to them. Uh, Jan is, uh, she was first lady of Gordon College for nearly 20 years. And one of the things that really um, was a hallmark of her time was her investment in people, whether it was faculty, staff, students. Um, she was like campus mom, campus grandma, like whatever you needed, Jan could do that. Uh, and the, uh, the impact that she had was amazing. She is uh, an author, uh, a speaker. She is proudly Norwegian. Right, I'm partially Norwegian, but I can tell her what, um, for Christmas, I'd like to have Fatiman, and she'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, but uh, Jan is um, an eloquent storyteller that opens the door to the gospel. So um, Jan's husband, uh, President Carlberg, back in 1998, uh, took a flyer on a veteran youth worker who was living in New Hampshire and hired him to uh, be one of the youth ministry professors here at Gordon College. And uh, it was 20, 24 years ago, um, Jen's late husband hired me to join the faculty here at Gordon. So um, they, uh, they've meant a lot to me, they've meant a lot to this school, and I am beyond delighted to introduce Jan Carlberg to a new generation of Gordon students, both present and future. So let's welcome Jan Kalber. Are you getting nervous that I had to have help getting up here? <laughs> you know, when we were singing Jesus Loves Me, I thought about Karl Barth, the great theologian who was asked, what was the greatest truth that he knew? And he said, Jesus loves me. This I know. I loved singing these songs with you. I love looking out and seeing you. Familiar faces, new faces, scared faces, hopeful faces, bored faces, <laughs> expectant faces. Best of all, you need to know that Jesus sees every one of you, knows you by name, and loves you. As we were singing today, I thought about something that happened to me two weeks ago in church. I mean, I grew up a Baptist preacher's kid, but I'm going to Christ Church, Episcopal Church in Hamilton now after many years of being at Grace Chapel. We just moved a little closer here and uh, after many years of being there. And I'm grateful for the heritage of so many different churches that are a part of what it means to follow Jesus and things that we can learn from each other in these various traditions. Anyhow, I was sitting in church and there's this family that sits to the side of me, to behind me sometimes, they've got three little girls. The youngest one is about, I'm guessing, two and a half. And church finished and at the end of our church, our church is liturgical, and it has at the end an organ piece that is played while we wait quietly before we all run to grab the coffee in the next room. But at the end of the service, this little girl jumped up and went, yay, yay. 
And I thought, well, there may be a few people thinking that. But then she went on to say, fun church, fun church. And I want to do that after singing today, fun church, fun church. It was wonderful to sing some of those familiar Sunday school songs and to be here among you. Well, this is a very significant month. February, not only did we have the greatest freeze in a generation a few days ago, but it's um, Black History Month. Yeah. And that's not something to be taken lightly by any of us. There is much that we owe, much that we've been responsible for and still are, much that we need to be grateful for to our black brothers and sisters, not just in music, which is often what we will think of, but art, science, history, mathematics, aeronautics, engineering, so many fields, botany, much for which we are to be grateful for. It's also Groundhog Day, which doesn't mean anything because that groundhog rarely gets it right. It's the month of the Super Bowl, but the Patriots aren't in it, so... Hmm. But it's also Valentine's Day, which brings hope to some and dread to others. I remember being with my little grandson out in California when he was about eight years old. And you know, back then you have to make those little shoe boxes and you had to bring Valentine's for everybody in your class. And so I'd done the thing that was responsible. I took him to CVS to buy a little box of Valentine's. Yes, they have CVS out in California too. They're everywhere. But anyhow, we got a box. One though, you get 30 Valentine's in it and you have 28 in the class, one for the teacher and one left over so you don't dare make a mistake. So we were looking through these and I saw all these cute little puppies and I said, Basil, what about these puppies? I said, Momo, everybody hates puppies. <laughs> I thought, what? He said, they don't like puppies. I said, well, instead of saying, are you crazy? I said, well, what do you think they'd like? Well, they like Spider-Man, so that's what we thought. I grew up, as I said, a Baptist preacher's kid, second generation Baptist preacher's kid. So I know all these songs that you were singing today. My husband was a third generation Baptist preacher's kid. Now, one thing growing up Baptist, you learn there are, or at least in our branch part of the Baptist church, there were certain things that were absolute no's. You weren't supposed to drink, you weren't supposed to smoke, you weren't supposed to play cards, you weren't supposed to go to movies, and above all, you weren't supposed to dance because that could lead to you know what. <laughs> well, eventually I learned about both. But my grandkids tease me because sometimes they'll have music on, I'll be doing something like this, and they've named it, oh, Momo's doing her T-Rex. <laughs> That's the era they think I'm from anyhow. <laughs> but I got this tile once that said, you know those little tiles that they have sayings on them, you can use them as a coaster. This one said, she danced like no one was watching, but someone was watching. Thought she was having a seizure and called an ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite stories from my mom was after we kids had gone on, I, my dad did not grow up in a Christian family. And after he'd become a Christian, um, well, he, he had danced, he, you know, that was, there were a lot of things that were not unfamiliar to him. But my mom, as a preacher's kid, Baptist Norwegian preacher's kid, had not danced, except when they would dance around the Christmas tree. They had a certain thing that they did at Christmas. And so all these years, we kids had finally all grown up, left the house, and my parents were now in their late 60s. My dad was in his early 70s, and it was Valentine's Day. My parents told me this story later. 
And my, my mom had fixed a beautiful dinner for them. She had candles lit. Baptists were good at cooking and baking. So we had a nice dinner. She had a nice dinner. The table was all set. The candles were all lit. And my dad came. They had this wonderful meal. And afterwards, they cleared off the dishes to bring in the dessert. Dessert and coffee were finished. My daddy got up, went over to this big old piece of furniture, which was a record player. And in there, he put on this old vinyl record, put the, turned it on, put the needle on, and it began to play this beautiful orchestral music by someone named Montavani. My dad went over and he bowed to my mother, reached out his hands for her to dance. My mother looked, looked up heavenward after a while and said, that's long enough. She got up and they danced all <laughs> over the house. You know, today I was thinking, and I have for this several weeks, what does it mean to have a divided heart? The psalmist cries out, Give me an undivided heart that I might fear your name. What do we fear? What's our heart divided over? What keeps us stuck? Something we've done? Something somebody else did? Something we need to forgive? Something we need to break? A habit? some notion we have about someone else, some other group of people? What has our heart divided? So I'm gonna ask you three questions. The first is, what's gone on long enough in your life? What's gone on long enough We're so distracted. Social media has us captive. We're glued to our phones. We're so interruptible. But not always for the things that contribute to a whole heart. More to a divided heart. Listen to this. What's gone on long enough? This is Black History Month. I want to read something to you that was in yesterday's New York Times. This was written by Tish Harrison Warren. As we begin Black History Month, all people, but especially people of faith and specifically people who identify as Christians, need to be challenged by the continuing witness and legacy of the black church and the lives of people like Fred Shuttlesworth. Who was Fred Shuttlesworth? Well, he was a pastor in Birmingham, Alabama in the 1950s and a close friend and colleague of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In September of 1957, the very day President Eisenhower signed the Civil Rights Act and lawyers sought legal aid to force Arkansas to integrate Central High in Little Rock, Shuttleworth organized the integration of Phillips High in Birmingham, Alabama, driving his own two children to enroll them there. He was met by a white mob that beat him with baseball bats, chains, and brass knuckles. As he was losing consciousness, something said to him, you can't die here. Get up. I have a job for you to do. Later that day in the hospital, a reporter asked Shuttlesworth what he was working for in Birmingham. He responded, hear this, for the day when the man who beat me and my family 
with chains at Phillips High School can sit down with us as a friend. What has gone on long enough and has contributed to our divided hearts? My second question, how are some ways to enlarge our hearts, to become wholehearted? Nobody likes a job done half-heartedly. How do we become more wholehearted? I don't know about you, but I love the Christmas story of the Grinch. All the Who's down in Whoville like Christmas a lot, but the Grinch who lived just north of Whoville did not. The Grinch hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right, or it could be perhaps that his shoes were too tight. But I think the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was too sizes too small. So whatever his reason, his heart or his shoes, the Grinch stood there on Christmas Eve hating the Who's. Who are the Who's to you? We need to be choosy about our words. As a little girl, I learned Psalm 119.11, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. My old Norwegian pastor grandfather said, Now, Janus, I want you to learn this, because this is what's true. Thy word is a good provision. Have I hid in my heart a good place, that I might not sin against thee? A good purpose. We need to choose our words carefully and know more of God's words and repeat them than the other stuff that comes to us through social media or casual talk about each other. We need to form holy habits. Church, not just online, that only goes so far, in person. A church is a place to belong. Church attendance has been shrinking all over the place because we like our jammies and our comfort and being at home in our sweats or not. Church is a place to belong, to know and be known, to be accountable, to be accounted for, to have a name, a place, a purpose. You know, just like that little girl, it can be a fun place, too. The third thing I think that helps is to be fully present wherever we are, to be aware. Psalm 46.10 reminds us to be still, to know that God is God. You never know where God's going to show up, through whom or how. When my husband first was going in for his chemo treatments at Mass General, right after we had left Gordon in 2011, it started that summer, and I remember going in, and Judd was being, uh, it was at Yawkey, this cancer center, and he was in those chairs where they begin to give you the chemotherapy, and to see that big, strong Swede, I branched out, that big, strong Swede, having all these needles and things poked into him, all these people surrounding him. And I, I was starting to just shake on the inside. And a young, I learned later, Haitian woman, who maybe was in her late 20s, early 30s, a nursing assistant, saw me standing over and must have sensed. Next thing I know, she's gone out, she's carried in heavy chair, 
put it down. Sit, Mama. I sat. She stood behind me, and after a while, this is what I heard. I said, I know that song. She said, I thought you might. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh God, my Father, my Savior, there is no shadow of turning with thee. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, God, Lord, unto me. And the last of the four things, the ways to enlarge our hearts, is to cultivate a thankful heart. Cultivate a thankful heart. The third question is, why all this focus on the heart? You know, Proverbs 4, 23 says, above all else, guard your heart. For it influences everything else in your life. When God says, all of the law can be summed up in love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength and your neighbor is yourself it begins with the heart it begins with the heart remember Jesus in the 13th chapter of John says to his disciples by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Somehow out there, we've gotten known for our hate. We've gotten known for what we don't like, for what we don't believe more than what we do believe, and how we're to love each other. That's no simple thing to do, and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Tony Campolo tells a story about this old, well, his name was Joe. And this took place at the Bowery Mission in New York, where my grandparents used to go sometimes to serve and help. But the mission there, there were drunks, addicts that would come in. Then, back then, it was Basically, the drug problem wasn't what we have today. But anyhow, one day, Joe, who'd been so lost, was found and began to realize, Jesus loves me, this I know. And his life was radically changed. And so Joe became the one who would clean up after somebody had thrown up clean up after people that had made messes in bathrooms, clean up, serve, wash the clothes, do the dirty dishes, do whatever needed doing. And it was astonishing to people around who had known him before. One day during one of those services that they had at the mission, another young man came who'd been struggling for such a long time and somehow he had a sense that God loved him and he could be forgiven and that divided heart made whole. And so he went to the front and he knelt down and he was praying and crying, God, make me like Joe. Make me like Joe. 
the one who'd been leading the service leaned over and tapped him and said, son, I think you mean make me like Jesus. And he said, is he like Job? <laughs> That's who we're to be to people. That's who we're to be. You know, in Colossians it says this, in the message translation, so chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you, compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline. Be even tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you. And regardless what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic, all-purpose garment. Never be without it. Christmas time, we'd gone out to California with the whole family, because that's the gift we wanted to be together. And as my son was leaving to go off with, all, with um, the couples, I was going to be with the grandchildren. Trust me, that is not punishment. I loved it. And Chad's leaving, going out the door. He's a Gordon alum. And he yells back and he says, I love you, Mom. I said, oh. And then he said, this time I mean it. <laughs> love each other and mean it for Jesus' sake and an undivided heart. Amen.